welcome, and uh, I'm delighted today to have an old friend of mine, uh, Steve Gunderson, a former congressman from Wisconsin, uh, and somebody who uh, I've known for many, many years. He's always been very creative, focused on solving problems, and uh, he has really tackled one of the most important problems in the country in his role as the head of uh, career education colleges and universities. And, and let me briefly explain from my perspective why I think that's really important. Uh, the fact is that we have an enormous gap in the level of job training we need for people to have careers, particularly people coming out of backgrounds where they may not have gone on to a four-year college or to a university or to a law school, but they want to have a chance to have a good, solid paying job doing something that's productive and it gives them a chance to uh, maintain their family. And uh, I'm going to turn it to Steve for a second just to describe the power of this sector and the great new campaign he's developing to have five million new career professionals get educated in the near future to really bring hope to uh, so much of America. But I want to take one moment to relate it directly to the most important recent news in our country, which has been about Milwaukee. Sheriff uh, David Clark has been making the point that a big part of why you have this festering hostility is that the uh, people who are trapped in poverty, who have no hope of getting out, who are told, you know, take your food stamps, live in public housing, and be quiet, that because they have no hope, they despair. And in despairing, they get angry and they get resentful. And the real answer to that is a job training program and a job creating program so that five million Americans can move back into middle class status. And a key part of that is the whole career education component and the idea of a campaign to create five million new jobs. So Steve, we're delighted to have you here. Thank Why you don't you much. share with uh, folks all across Facebook land what you're trying to accomplish and why it's so morally important. Well, it, it, and it frankly is a moral question because we are talking about both a skills gap in America and an opportunity gap in America at the same time. And the one way we solve that is we find that bridge to real skills, real jobs, real income, and a real chance for the middle class. And we are looking at, in an average year, 2.3 to 2.5 million students, many of them adults, almost all of them are low income, they are minorities, they have one or more challenges to success based on their life situation, um, that enroll in our schools to achieve a particular career. In a typical year, we will come up with about three quarters to a million uh, actual academic awards with occupational skills that give them the chance to go out and get that real job. Unfortunately, it's a sector that also is uh, under the gun, uh, both economically and in terms of regulation, assault by the current administration, and um, that has some impact on schools, but we're not here to save schools, we're here to save opportunity and access for students, and if those students don't have that access and opportunity, we will have a widened income gap in this country, and we will have literally no opportunity to meet the skills. Well, you, you used to represent Wisconsin in the Congress, and when you hear Sheriff Clark say, as he did yesterday, that the that Milwaukee is the sixth poorest city in the United States, and that the center, the, the areas that have had violence recently, are people feel hopeless. How does that relate back to your passion and your commitment to try to bring jobs and learning and a chance to get a you know a better future by working for it, but working for it with a skill and with a capability? I mean, how, as somebody who's from Wisconsin, yeah. how do you relate to that whole experience? Well, I, I relate to it, and frankly, the reason I'm into this business is because when I was a member of Congress, we were looking at the reality that the family dairy farm was going out of business because it was a way of life, not an economically viable uh, operation, and second, because rural manufacturing had gone south and then gone east, and so we had all these adults who were dislocated who didn't have opportunities and they needed skills. And so I had to represent them, I had to get involved in what you and I would call lifelong learning, uh, workforce investment kind of programs. And that kind of an economic transition is not unique to rural Wisconsin. It is in the inner cities of America, and it is in particular in those communities that are challenged economically and students do not have access to any kind of post-secondary career education. 
all of the goals in this country, uh, from the Lumina Foundation to President Obama, etc., have said we have to have 60 percent or more of the adult working population with some kind of post-secondary skills. You can't do that unless you give the, this element of our population and citizens that very opportunity. And you know, let's let's uh, be bipartisan for a second and say Hillary Clinton is absolutely right in her acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention when she said, "Not everyone needs a four-year liberal arts degree. There are many other ways to give them that opportunity to success, and that's what this sector is all about." Well, and and I've, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but um, it, it strikes me that um, the amount of money you can earn, for example, being a welder, or that you can earn being uh, a medical technician is dramatically greater than people think, uh, and in some cases greater than uh, some liberal arts graduates are going to make coming out of a four-year college. And can, can you talk for a second about the, the different kinds of learning that we're talking about when we discuss this? Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, I mean, we, we start out with the fact that uh, health care is growing because of demographics in this country, so we are seeing a significant growth in the demand uh, for health care professionals. When you move from there, you move to technology, and, and I love to bring up the example that uh, when the Democrat uh, National Committee was hacked recently, uh, it just exemplified the need for what you and I would call cybersecurity. Uh, professionals. Uh, we do a lot in the area of IT. When you look at construction and trades, you are looking at a significant increase in that particular area. Uh, when you're looking at automotive or uh, other kind of technicians, there, there's a dramatic demand in growth. When you look at culinary, I mean, it is a occupation that has to have a specific occupational skill to succeed. And uh, I could give story after story of individuals who have tried traditional four-year liberal arts, they have tried community colleges, and it's been too broad, it hasn't been focused uh, in a way that enables them to learn that skill before they just give up and, and leave, and so as a result of that, they drop out. Some of those students have come to our schools and they've learned those skills, and, and I know of an individual uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, he became an HVAC technician, uh, he now is a regional director, he tells the story of living in the first house he's ever had that has a washer and dryer, um, and that he is earning between seventy and a hundred thousand dollars a year. And all that started because he had access to one of our the kind of training that gave him a, a chance for a better future. Well, and in that sense, it strikes me that you have an opportunity here, and, and uh, the tragedy is that the, the government has been squeezing down the very sector which would help the Milwaukee's and the Chicago's and the Baltimore's with job training for people who need that first step up the ladder, and who need that first set of skills to be able to go out and get a good paying job. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, if you look at history, Benjamin Franklin actually is credited with creating the very first career education program in America, um, but it's indicative of the fact that in the early American history we looked at accounting and business kind of courses and then we looked at the particular skills that were needed in the labor and the trades, etc. These were often small family owned schools and that has evolved over time to where we literally at the beginning of this re recession we were up to almost four million students a year. We probably grew too much too fast. We were focused on access not outcomes and that was our mistake as well as anybody else's and we had some bad outcomes. We had dropouts and we had defaults and all of that. The sector has changed but the current administration won't give them any credit for that change. They won't say let's have a set of outcomes across all of higher ed because we have public investment in all of higher education and have those same set of outcomes. They're putting them only on our sector in a way that are putting schools out of business. We probably in the last five years have seen a decline in enrollment in our schools of about 900,000 uh, over that five-year period, year to year, yet we're seeing an increase in academic awards of about 120,000 with 900,000 less students. So you see the focus is on academic awards now, the outcomes that we want. So you also are in danger, you have, I think if I have remember correctly, 850 campuses with about 800,000 students right now. And ideally we'd like to grow that so that we could have millions of Americans getting the job training they need in order to get a good, solid, middle-class job. We, 
Uh, I'm going I'm to use words that uh, people might think were more your words than mine. We're, we're in a critical national crisis. Um, the reality is that we need more skilled workers, we need more bridges to opportunity, and yet we are seeing a, an attack by the government, the federal government in particular, that is eliminating the very schools that provide that opportunity. Um, I'm a big fan of every element of higher education, big fan of community colleges. Most of the community colleges in America are under-resourced, over-committed, have no ability to enroll more students, and if they do enroll them, uh, the waiting period to get in the classes you want is so long that the delay in getting it, you know, drives that student uh, off into dropping out. Um, and yet, those community colleges today are becoming more a feeder system to four-year liberal arts as a way to hold down the cost of a liberal arts degree. All understandable, nothing in there is bad, but as a result of that, our sector of career education schools, for-profit, non-for-profit, public, whatever they might be, is the only place in America we have to meet the emerging skill demand of post-secondary occupational skills. So, and when, for example, you were talking about earlier uh, occupational skills. So as you get breakthroughs in new medical technology, people actually have to learn how to use that technology in order to earn a living, delivering better services, better health care, what have you. And the, the schools you represent uh, are actually at the core of being able to help people acquire a better job and acquire a better set of capabilities so that this year, as you point out with, with your story about the guy from Pennsylvania, this year they may have an initial entry level job. Five years from now, as their skills increase and their experience increases, they may be at a middle management job. All of that starts with learning this first set of marketable, usable skills. No question about it. And, and I'm going to actually use myself as, a, as an example because I went to the University of Wisconsin, got a great four-year liberal arts degree, loved the place, loved the institution, but it was all theory. It was not practical. And I needed to go to a broadcasting school to learn how to do what you and I would call efficient communications. Uh, you need that practical, and that's what our schools do. Uh, and without that, and, and in today's world, let's take cybersecurity, bring that back. Whether you're in business, you're in healthcare, uh, or you're in a series of other fields, today that field needs that experience and that broad general occupation, and it needs that specific credential in cybersecurity. And those are the kind of credential programs that our sector is, is, is leading, really at the front in the design and delivery. So if, if you were watching us and you decided that creating 5 million new jobs would be really helpful, and that creating them so that people in the inner city in Baltimore or in Chicago or in uh, Milwaukee had access to hope rather than to dependency, um, what should that person who's watching us what should they tell their member of Congress or their senator? It's very simple. As a federal policymaker, post-secondary career education in this country is at risk. And if you believe people ought to have the opportunity to get an occupational skill, you need your member of Congress to say, primarily to the Department of Education, you need to stop what you are doing to put this sector carte blanche out of business. If you've got a bad school in any part of higher education, go after that school, but don't destroy the sector in the process. And and if they want to learn more about this, uh, where would they go? Uh, best place to go is www.career.org. That's our website where we provide all that kind of information. And, and one of the questions we had come in uh, from Stephen Cretien, who's the, the, the most frequent questioner we get. Oh, really? Yeah, he actually uh, came by bus to see me in Williamsburg at a book stand. Huh. He's a very committed young man. So, Speaker Gingrich and Mr. Gunderson, do you expect to see a labor shortage in positions like elevator repairman and physician's assistant if we keep this disastrous defense to repayment rule as it discourages career schools from teaching the necessary skills? Well, it's not going to only uh, discourage them, it's going to put them on business. I mean, the defense to repayment rule, as it's written right now, is not about defense to repayment, because we all believe there ought to be a bar defense to repayment. If a school commits academic fraud, that student ought not be held liable for it. But there are what you and I would call add-ons, auxiliary provisions put onto this proposed rule that will allow those who believe all education must be delivered by the public sector, that will allow those people to file frivolous lawsuits 
requiring letters of credit being posted by the school, it'll put school out of business. And they put good schools out of business, not schools in financial trouble, good schools out of business. And, and these, this particular thing is triggered by the act of filing a lawsuit, not by the act of winning a lawsuit. Oh, that's right. It does not depend on judgment. It depends on if a lawsuit is filed. I think there are like 13 to 16 different triggers for the department being able to require a school to post a new 10% letter of credit based of 10% of your total Title IV financial aid uh, funding. And um, some of those are such things as um, if your school fails a number of programs in the new gainful employment regulation and the metrics of that aren't even out. So you don't even know what those metrics are, whether your debt to earnings ratios are gonna pass or fail, but they're saying, oh, by the way, we know you don't know what that is, but if you fail that, whenever it does come out, we're gonna require a 10% letter of credit. And if you have a lawsuit, we're gonna require a 10% letter of credit. If you have a significant gyration up or down in your enrollment or in your um, Title IV funding from year to year, let's say, for example, there's a recession that goes up and post-recession it goes down and there's a dramatic, because many of our programs are one to two year programs or less. That would be a basis for a letter of credit. Um, and in the current environment, these schools could not get a letter of credit because under the uh, FDIC standard, no bank could give them a letter of credit when the school is designed in a way that it is conditioned upon enrollment as a revenue. So, so you also, what you have is people who hate small business and hate the private sector deliberately setting up a series of rules that are designed to kill the sector. It's not designed to improve it or to regulate it, it's designed to kill it. Well, that's, that's the net effect, and I, I have often said, and let's take, for example, um, a, a case that happened last week, which you're aware of, which was one of our schools was told, because we've all been told for-profit is bad, so you should be non-profit. One of our schools has spent a four-year time period trying to become non-profit. IRS approved it three, four years ago. The second criteria was getting the Department of Education to approve it. The Department of Education denied that request for moving from a for-profit to a non-profit status. Now, why do I bring that up? Because on the one hand, they've said, we don't want for-profits. But if a school then tries to convert to non-profit, we're not going to let you do that either. So what does the school do? They're going to catch 22. The, the only reality of those scenarios is schools just give up. So, which then means students don't have a place to go, they don't acquire the skills, they don't have a chance to rise, and we as a country don't have the skilled workforce we need. That's exactly right. So, uh, Brenda and Chmielewski said, I hope I got that right, Brenda, uh, when are we going to stop teaching for tests and start teaching life skills for these students to survive in the real world? You know, I wish, uh, Brenda, you could go with me and visit one of our schools because if you would do so, you would see that the training at these schools is so focused on preparing them for a job that they literally prepare them how to write a resume, how to do an interview, how to dress for an interview, and in some cases, they even um, do the funding to enable that student to dress properly, to come into the interview, so they, they it's the whole package. Uh, what's different about our program, and, and you know, the question of testing, are there tests here? Absolutely, but the tests are academically focused on the particular training program. A, a good friend of mine from South Florida who could not move through any other kind of traditional higher education gave up almost, and, and he applied to go to one of our schools, and they said, uh, you can only enroll if you're full time. He said, I got a job, I can't do that, I can't do that, I, I'm not that good of a learner. Uh, all of a sudden the school said, don't worry, we do one course at a time, so you can concentrate on one course, you don't have five different three credit courses, but one course at a time. That was the way the student could learn the specialty, could complete the courses, and now has the degree. That's great. So Luther Lewis says, why does everyone feel like a child should go to college? Plumbers make $95 an hour and up, and make a good living. Well, I, I hate to say it, but in, in, in some ways I think we've become an elitist society that says if you don't have a liberal arts uh, degree, uh, you, you somehow are not a qualified professional in America. And the reality is it is the rest of America that makes America work. 
and, and we need to recognize that there is not a one-size-fits-all for higher education. Uh, there, every element of post-secondary education adds its unique and appropriate role to play, including post-secondary career education. I think it was John Gardner, the founder of Common Cause, who once said that a country uh, that values philosophers over plumbers may end up with neither its philosophy nor its plumbing holding water. That's, that's exactly <laughs> where we are. Um, you know, it's interesting, I've got a couple brothers who are, are in the automotive business, you happen to know them, um, and they recently, uh, in the last election, they met with a member of Congress um, to uh, make, to support them politically and financially. And the member of Congress said to them, these now they're in the automotive business, said, what can I do to help you? Uh, and the uh, two brothers of mine said, we're not going to ask for anything for the automotive sector, but if you don't stop this war, on those schools training automotive technicians, we're not going to be able to hire the technicians we need. Uh, and that's how you, this all becomes connected. Well, and that's what people need to realize when they take their car in, that modern cars are so complicated, you can't fix them in your backyard. That's right. And you actually have to have somebody who knows all the different computers and all the different things, uh, and who's had pretty intense training to be able to fix your car. And, uh, and I know both your brothers, and I know neither one of them could fix a car if their life depended. <laughs> Nor could I. <laughs> yeah. So, one last one. Um, Patrick Hughes asked, this is a slightly different zone. I've okay. never heard you talk about this. Okay. Uh, what plan would you propose for handling the student loan debt problem? Okay, first of all, let's put the student loan debt problem in perspective. And I'm going to use Brookings Institution, which is a center-left think tank in Washington, D.C. But they have done some pretty detailed analysis of the student loan situation, and, and they have come out and said that 2013, when they entered repayment, the typical student from a career school had a $12,500 debt. Typical student from a four-year non-prestigious state college university had a $20,000. Typical student from a four-year prestigious had $26,000. So let's put all of these in perspective. You want to know where we have defaults? When they have the loan and not the degree. You get these students in a program where they finish school and you will eliminate well over half of the defaults in this country today. The second thing that you should do, and, and we've, we've actually advocated as a sector, if you want to solve default and take that word out of the American language, you do what Australia and Canada have done. You have a uniform, automatic, income-based repayment program for every student based on what they're earning that year. So their repayment is based on their ability to pay that particular year. The third thing that's going to happen here is that you're going to see more and more credentials. And as a result of that, you're going to have a stepping stone post-secondary education. You're going to start at this level of health care. And you're going to have this education, this credential, you're going to go to work. Then you're going to come back a year or two later, and you're going to get more education and a higher credential in a higher paying job. And you're going to do this incrementally in a stepping stone process. We will spread the cost of education out over their life career in a way that makes it all affordable. Okay. Well, I hope all of you uh, decide to follow up with Steve and look at what they're doing. Uh, and uh, do you have any last word you'd like to this, share, my, share with our Facebook world? My, my only word is this really is a crisis. And it's a crisis for America in two ways. If we don't have post-secondary occupational skills, we will not be competitive in the global market. More important, if we don't have this access to occupational skill and opportunity, we will have an entire segment of the American population with no hope. No skills, no job, no income, no hope. Good. So thank you all very much.